Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Hello and welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. My name is Todd McLaughlin and I'm so delighted to bring to the show, to introduce you to, I'm sure you probably know who he is, Gil Headley. Uh, Gil Headley is a dedicated anatomy professional teacher. He has dedicated his life to studying the human body through cadaver dissection and then relating the information that he's learned to anyone and everybody who is interested in the human body, but not just from a scientific and memorization of names and parts and places style, but more in one that helps us to connect with the human body on also a philosophical level and, ha- and, and cultivate a deep understanding of what it means to be human. And Gil is amazing, and I'm so happy, and this opportunity is just, you know, I'm so stoked. So you got to check him out, gilheadley.com. Uh, he's on all the social channels, Facebook, IG, and definitely go look at him on YouTube, at Somanot. Uh, his videos are epic. If you're a yoga practitioner, body worker, whatever your field is, a nurse, a doctor, uh, or just a yoga, pra- not just a yoga practitioner, but a yoga practitioner that's fascinated in, in, in yoga and understanding their, our bodies, you got to go watch this guy. He's going to be here in North Palm Beach on Thursday, February 22nd. And he's going to be all over Florida as well. He's going to be in Orlando, Feb 25, in Miami, Feb 20. So definitely share this episode so that people know that Gil's going to be in town uh, check out his website, gilheadley.com, which is in the description below. He's touring with his wife, Rachel Scott. And thank you, Rachel, for all your kind correspondence with me. And, and please go check out Rachel at rachelyoga.com. And I hope to bring Rachel on the show here soon for you as well. Um, but you you really got to go see Gil and meet Rachel. They are such an incredible couple and y- you will be fascinated. So Listen to this conversation, get a little bit of insight into the, the, how fascinated Gil is by the body and, and the amount of time and hours that he spent studying and bringing quality information to the table. So with that being said, let's go ahead and begin. So excited to have this opportunity to bring Gil Headley onto the podcast today. Gil, you are an inspiration to me. I've been hearing about you for years and enjoying your content on YouTube. Uh, You're a master anatomy teacher and use the terminology somanat. Um, This is just a real honor to have you here. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? Thank you, fellow (laughs) somanat. I'm doing good. Did you come up with that term or did you come up with that term or did you, did you hear that? I did. I did. I I was actually, I was the editor of the Rolf Lines journal back in the mid nineties when I had completed my PhD and started my Rolfing career. And they're like, oh, you, you, you do this thing, (laughs) do this Rolf Lines journal thing for us. So for very um, cool. Two or three years, I was editor of Rolf Heinz, and I interviewed Emily Conrad. Mm. And uh, she, uh, I forgot to press play or oh. record. On a, oh. I talked to her for like two straight hours, and then I was like, damn, I, I had one of those little handheld mini cassette recorders. <laughs> this was back in the 90s. And uh, yes, so I was like, I got to write an article anyway. That was great. So basically, <laughs> I was trying to describe Emily for the Rolf Lines audience. And I called her a Soma, not uh, Soma for body and not for navigator and sailor, you know, so a body sailor, a body navigator. So I, I quickly adopted it as my own That's sort a- of name, uh, you know, being Soma was what I called my business back then. And uh, 
and everyone wants to be a somanaut now. So all you got to do is admit that you're interested in diving into inner space and voila, you're a somanaut. I love it. That's so cool. And, you know, Gil, I'm really excited to see you when you're on a tour right now that you call the Nerve Tour. Mm -hmm. Um, For those that are listening, uh, Gil is in his motorhome. Uh, For those you watching on YouTube, you can see his his backdrop. Very creative. I like it. And, um, you know, I see that you're you're touring 111, 111 cities across the United States over it looks like a period of like maybe eight months or so. Um, well, actually, we started in October, um, got to back home for Christmas around December 19th and hit the road again about a week ago. And we'll go we'll go quite right on through next December. Amazing. Wow. Uh, we'll so have some time than... at home. Yeah. I will be returning to Colorado with Rachel. She has projects to do and I will be teaching my regular dissection schedule in the lab. So I have four, three dissections scheduled for this year that I'll return home for. But other than that, we're going to be, we're going to be uh, city after city. We we wanted to go everywhere, so that's what we're doing. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, all of you listening, please check the, the his website. It's gillheadley.com, dot com, and you can see the whole list. And you know, if if he's coming to your town, you can check him out. How is it being on the road like that? I mean. I, I think it would be amazing, but obviously being on the road for that long of a time can be challenging. What What is your experience thus far? It's it's fun, actually. Uh, we get to be in all kinds of cool places and meet wonderful, warm audiences in different cities. And we make a point of trying out the local diner or what have yeah. you. <laughs> we try and go as off-brand as possible. Off uh, off corporate brand as possible and see what folks folks are doing locally. So that's fun for us. And uh, we do a lot of driving, uh, a lot of admin. It's a bottomless uh, pit of admin to run a project this this massive. And fortunately, I couldn't you know, I couldn't do it without Rachel, my partner. Yes. And also a number of other people in the background who are sort of you know keeping us going. We do a lot of camper maintenance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a, a vehicle that's your home and your office and your tour bus, uh, you know, it takes a beating. So we, we keep up with our camper and um, I bet. You know, sleep at a lot of truck stops and, and roadside uh, rest areas on the highways. We'll take what we can get. Uh, folks are like, stay at my house, come in, we'll have a bedroom for you. I'm like, no, I have my bedroom. Thank you. <laughs> it's perfect. I believe uh, it. We appreciate the hospitality and we tend to pass on it because, um, I don't know, I like to know where my toothbrush is every night. So. <laughs> That's awesome, Gil. You know, you're, you seem dedicated and committed to educating people about human anatomy. Can you give me a little is, bit of... That is true. I, I am on a mission. It's, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed, actually. And this tour is about the nerve tour or about the nervous system I'm gathering. I'm sure it encompasses everything, but can you give me a little bit of insight into what your goal is with this education yeah. process that you're involved in? Absolutely. Yeah, I did. I undertook a large project um, a year ago, uh, basically January through May of 2023, I was full time in the lab. I'm talking super full time, uh, filming the uh, doing the dissection of of a donor who I call Captain. Uh, he was a pilot, <laughs> and uh, and so I did. I wanted to do a detailed dissection of the nerve tissues in relationship to demonstrate that through photography and and footage. Um, it's not something I've been able to do throughout my career. I've been being, I've been carefully bringing forward the textural biological layers of the body, uh, because I feel like body workers, whether they structural integrators or otherwise can really connect through texture. And so that's been my emphasis and demonstrating continuity across regions. I'm not a regional anatomist, I'm an integral anatomist. So my I'm very keen to demonstrate relationship, continuity, um, uh, and these textural layers as whole body and whole person phenomenon, really. So that's been going great. But when you when you dissect by layers, you prune the you prune the nerve tree really hard when you do it. Mm. Uh, so I've demonstrated the central nervous system in my workshops um, hundreds of times, but um, 
but the more the peripheral branching of the nerve tree, I haven't given as much, found as much detail and no less the autonomics, which are really hard to dissect. So I thought, let me just do this project and it will create um, basically a, vi a visual document of the nerve tree in the wild, you know, in the woods, in someone's body, not just in a book. Uh, so we can see that and, you know, basically up the game of the bodywork community, the yoga, Pilates, fitness industries in their relationship to the nervous system done from an integral approach. So that's kind of my goal. Wow. Not only that, upping that game, but also bringing on board into my world those folks who have a keen interest in the nervous system already and you know, have studied it in their uh, in their preparation for their career, doctors, uh, you know, osteopaths, naturopaths, allopaths, um, chiropractors, uh, PTs, OTs, the kind of people in, in those sort of other allied medical professions, as well as the physicians themselves who have a keen interest in the nerve, nerve tissues. But it takes a lot to put it together in an actual body. You know, it takes a lot to put it together from the books. You can't, actually. And wow. so I did... I did take it even further than I had hoped, actually, in the five months that I worked <laughs> on the project, so that I have a wonderful, um, a wonderful compendium of videos now that document these tissues. And also, you know, the finale is quite beautiful because I did manage to kind of extract the whole nervous tree from the body, including the autonomics, the musculoskeletal plexuses, the sympathetic trunk, spinal cord, all in relationship. So you see Whoa. it as one, as the one thing that it is, um, but that you can't put together by paging through a book, you know? Wow. Has anybody done this to the level that you've taken it that you know of? Um, yes, actually. In 1925, <laughs> wow. It doesn't happen often, <laughs> but in 1925, there were two medical students at the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Kirksville, Missouri, and their professors noticed what a great job they did on this arm, and they were like, do that to the whole body, Wow! and they gave them a, a cadaver, and they spent 1,500 hours, this pair of medical students, and did an the most astonishing demonstration of the nerve tissues that I think may ever be done. I, I couldn't compete with it, to be honest. Um, but there's only been a few others who've, you know, Von Hagen's has a pretty nice demonstration um, in the, uh, you know, Body, Body Worlds exhibit. Um, but it's, I kind of took it a little further, actually, because I did the autonomic uh Plexuses in great detail and brought them out together with the rest. So, wow. um, it, it was it was really interesting. <laughs> so, I can't I can't imagine what type of physical skill does this require. I read a book by Abraham Verges recently, both of his Cutting for Stone and Covenant of Water, where in some of his writing he'll speak about the intricacy of how skillful the going into the cadaver, how much skill is required in the finesse. Can you explain a little bit about the challenge that that presented you? Mm. Thanks for asking. Not many people even think about that, <laughs> but it, it was, I had to dissect very differently than I usually do. Um, in the lab for a class, I'm kind of going for speed. Mm. So I, I expedite the dissections as I want the participants to take their time and to really connect with what they're doing. And I can kind of promise not to worry. You'll never get behind because I can come up behind you and catch it up, uh, mm. you know, very quickly. So, yes. and so there's a lot of skill in that actually. And I have a really deep connection to the, to the tissue textures that allow me to work differently with each biological textural layer so that you know they come out nicely and and yet when approaching the nerve tissues i had to kind of abandon that strategy wow. slow it way down put the scalpel down this is not scalpel work this is paddling so i have this little stainless steel spatula that's way smaller than my pinky it's about a millimeter thick and 
not as not as broad as my pinky and i basically dissected his body with a little tiny metal spatula wow. and and a hemostat so paddle pull paddle pull paddle pull and did that for hundreds of hours in excruciating physical positions that i'm still recovering from uh even seven months after the project ended wow uh, because it, it's like doing a you know a yoga posture for five six seven hours a day uh bent and twisted uh while you know trying to hold the glasses on the tip of my nose while i go <laughs> like this kind of you know so it, it wasn't comfortable <laughs> and so there's there's a lot that goes into why this sort of thing doesn't happen very often mm. just the sheer physicality of it um and then skill the skill is is to not cut anything <laughs> you know it, it, you know, it's a it's like a negative skill. It's like, are you patient enough and slow enough that you can bring this tissue forward into visibility without destroying it? And even that being said, um, you still have to take away more than the thing is in order for there to be any potential for a visual connection or recognition. Interesting. So you you have to, it's a th process of abstracting, abstraho, to draw away from. You're constantly drawing tissues away until you've drawn away just enough that it's clear enough that you can say, aha, I'm actually looking at something rather than just a massive wall of, of inscrutable lymphatics or something like that. Wow. I first heard about you when I was taking a neuro neuromuscular therapy training with Judith Delaney here in mm -hmm. Miami, and uh, people were raving about you and your skill as a teacher in the cadaver realm, and I've never had that opportunity myself. I am extremely interested and would love to try it, so I'm so fascinated to hear some of like the intricacies of, intricacies of what you're speaking of in terms of the skill involved. Yeah, it's super fun, and I can take anybody especially body workers, because you all have great connection with the body with your hands. Medical students don't have that, right? It's way harder to teach medical students dissection than it is to teach body workers dissection, right? Because of that built-in comfort with the body. You know, you ask a medical student to like hold the head and they don't know what to do with it. They think mm. it's like a China, a bowl of China, whereas you'd ask a body worker to hold the head and they're like, ah, you know. <laughs> so it makes all the difference in the world uh, also to have self-motivated learners, you know, in the lab. So it's one thing to be told you have to do a dissection. It's another thing to say, I'm going to save up my money and put away a week of my life and I'm going to fly somewhere and do a dissection. And that's a lot of, you know, that mm. level of interest makes for a really powerful um, learning opportunity for everybody because everybody's on board and in with both feet and excited to learn, has a base of knowledge. And then we're going to basically destroy that base of knowledge in order to create <laughs> a new base of knowledge uh, that's based on an actual actual tissue, actual body, you know, actual human anatomy as opposed to 2D book images. Very cool. Did you, is this, is this something that like you were interested in as a child? What, what what piqued your interest? What what was your? When did you I, get bit by I, the, the yeah, sort of bug? Freshman year in high school, I, wow. I skipped into the biology class instead of the earth sciences or whatever. And the teacher, we had a rat, so I did a great job on my rat so much so that she told me and my buddy, you you should do this cat. <laughs> and so the teacher had an extra cat from the advanced biology class. So freshman year, I dissected a cat. Uh, I must have been, whatever, 13, 14 years old, and I loved it. And by the time I got to be a senior, I was walking around the advanced biology lab teaching my friends how to dissect their cats <laughs> and uh, wow. feeling very comfortable with it at an early age. But when I went to grad went to college, you know, I had a job in the biology lab bagging fetal pigs and cleaning out test tubes, but I didn't do any dissection in college. I didn't do any dissection again, actually, until... I was in grad school and I was um, I had gone to the Rolf Institute and done the massage training, the foundations of body work. They called it way back in the in the early 90s and 91. I took that. And um, and so I learned massage, you know, it was basic Swedish Esalen style uh, Swedish type of massage. 
And when I got back to grad school and started practicing on my friends, I had one friend say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in medical school. You know, I had a med school at the University of Illinois and, you know, I need a study partner. I'm going to go in on the weekends to study for our Monday test. Do you want to come with me? I was like, sure. And so, you know, they would have done an arm that week and then there'd be one arm left. So he'd be, you do that arm while I study this arm and you do that leg. I'll study this. Leg. So I did that for, for, I think four iterations. I, I went into the lab with him and that was my initial wow. dissection experience. And, uh, I actually signed up with the medical school at university of Chicago. One of the professors there, I'm like, hi, I'm in an ethics program, but I really want to dissect a cadaver. He's like, all right, I'll see if I can find you one. And, uh, I was going to do kind of an independent study, even in grad school. I, I was so keen on it, and uh, that that didn't actually go through. But by the time I trained and completed my rolfing training, I went to uh, the annual meeting in I think it was 1993 or 1994, and they were having their first meeting of the anatomy faculty in like 10 years. So Tom Myers and Robert Schleip and Lewis Schultz and uh, and uh, just the whole gang from back then and and Tom and Robert were like, Gil, why don't you come to our anatomy meeting? It'll, you know, Ron Thompson, you know, that whole gang. And so wonderful people. And so I went and I was like, hey, fellas, it was all guys. It was like 10 guys. Hey, how, you know, wouldn't it be neat if you all did that, uh, you know, dissection again, like you did 10 years before that? Well, Ida Rolf had been there and she had, you know, gone into the lab with Lewis and Ron Thompson. Ron took a million pictures and and that became the basis of of a whole study. And I thought, let's let's repeat that. It's it's time. They're like, yeah, that's a great idea. First guy to get a cadaver, you know, we'll all go there and we'll do it. I was like, awesome. And <laughs> so it let it lie. And then like two, three months later, I'm like, how come I haven't gotten the call yet? Like, where's the cadaver? When are we gonna go? Mm. And so I'm calling the other other folks and they're like, I didn't get a cadaver. I was like, oh, no, one's, that was my idea. No one's going to do this. I have to do it. <laughs> so I called around a little bit and lined up a cadaver and, uh, and a laboratory. I, I was Dr. Headley at that point. I could be like, hello, this is Dr. Headley. I represent the International Anatomy Faculty of the Rolf Institute. And uh, we would like ourselves a laboratory and a cadaver, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the dude was like, you come to my office. We'll chat about that. I was like, oh, <laughs> I made dear friends with that guy. Uh, Roger Faison, and nice. he invited me, and I was like, okay, well, I got the cadaver, I got the lab, I called the other people up, and they're like, I have recently bought a horse and need to shoe it. <laughs> you know, I have recently married, and I'm in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, they're not coming. Oh, no. So I got my my Rolf, my Rolf Institute directory, and like... <laughs> <laughs> went to, you know, started doing like a one mile, then a five mile radius around the lab, then a 10 mile, 20 mile radius around the lab and just called people until I had put together a group of eight people. And 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 I did my first. Wow. I led my first dissection because I'm like, well, they don't know what they're doing. And I'm ahead of the game by four days. So wow. <laughs> that's how it started. That's amazing, Gil. So focused, so dedicated. Hung, hungry yeah, for it quickly yeah. before you knew it I, that's what i wanted to do you know I, I was more interested in the in the anatomy than i i was finding myself teaching anatomy to my all thing clients without them in real without their really keen interest <laughs> so i'm like i think i want them you know so I, I just expanded that when i ran out of rolfers i went to the massage therapist and and then i I, uh, and then that expanded into just anyone, you know, who who had an interest. I stopped advertising in like 1993, I think. No, wow. 19, sorry, 2003. 2003, I stopped. I was advertising full page ads in a massage magazine and, and that kind of thing. And then I was like, no, I just want to see what happens with word of mouth. So I, I just dropped the advertising. And at that point, the people who I taught already had just told their friends and it's been word of mouth oh, ever since. Mouth. My whole business is word of mouth. Amazing. Even this tour is word of mouth. I, I I haven't advertised in magazines or anything like that. It's so cool. I know I've been enjoying watching your website and just seeing uh, the way that you've laid out the excitement for the mm. event. On that note, what have you learned 
about the nervous system. What, what, have you got like what, 35 what, hours, maybe 40 hours we can chat? <laughs> no, what have I learned? I, okay, well, I, I realize it's a big question. All, yeah, I, I mean, I'm yeah, so curious. So, I mean, there's got to be some insights, some big ones. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many insights. I'll give you five hours worth of insights at the <laughs> talk, and then I'll edit the 97 days of footage and give you a bit more. Um, so, well, for one thing, uh, the, the the nervous system is a mental abstract convention, right? That's a left a brain box abstract, or category. Yeah, yeah. And what we actually have is the human body, an embryo differentiated into all kinds of textures and structures that remain one. A nerve is an organ, not a, you know, a, any given nerve is a composite of tissues. It has its blood vessels with their epithelial, you know, there's it, it nerve tissue, there's there's uh, connective tissue, right? And you can't separate these things. You can't separate the brain from the heart. You can't separate the nervous tissue from the connective tissue. You can't separate these things. They're a they're, um, functioning whole, right? And mm. so when we say, a nerve, even people are thinking a neuron. They're not thinking of it as a composite structure in relationship to other tissues and only functioning in that relationship. I, so many times while dissecting, we're like, "Is this a nerve, or is this like connective tissue?" And it's like, "Yes, mm. it's a nerve and it's connective tissue. That's innervated fascia, or that string there is is a fibrous collagenous." guitar string with communication pathways running through it. You know, so you can't physically differentiate these things. You can only mentally differentiate them. So I think that's important to know that you're always touching all of it. Yes. That doesn't mean you can't be specific in your touch, though. You can be highly specific in your touch through intention, Right. And through yes. your connection to the different textures, because the body, though it is one, is differentiated into many textures. But the brain's tendency, once you differentiate something, is to separate it out and to make it a distinct, individual, remembered thing. And it's never that in the actual body. It's mm. never that. It's always mm. the whole. Mm. That's that's the, that's the right brain's lesson, you know, basically that it perceives the whole in context. Everything is in context. And so what I love to do is sh show people the context of their favorite thing so that they have an expanded understanding and a more comprehensive and meaningful and more therapeutically relevant understanding of the thing that's your favorite. So if your favorite thing is fascia, great. I'm going to show you fascia in relationship. You come in as a massage therapist and your brain is in the muscle. I'm going to say, great. You love muscle tissue. Well, let me show you what that really is. Because every named muscle tissue is a ab mental abstraction, <laughs> right that's been cut away from the body it's not what it actually is number one number two it has viscera every named muscle tissue has guts it has it has the brain and heart plugged into its belly it has a belly it has lymphatics it has everything so let's understand something like even a muscle as an organ in relationship and put it into context of its fascia and, and expand from there. Now, uh, massage therapists, you don't go, it's Wednesday before you see muscle tissue in, in my dissection class. So people are like, we started on Monday, I just spent two days, I'm really confused, I'm lost at sea here, I haven't seen my best friends yet. I'm like, sorry, that's what a human body is. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm dragging this out so that you can enter into a relationship with what a human body actually is rather than the fantasy that you're touching. Wow. Great point. Fascinating. <laughs> I, I saw one of your YouTube videos you made. There's, there's a lot of myths and a lot of things we say as either massage therapists or yoga teachers that might be a little incorrect. And I'm curious, say a classic one might be uh, breathe deeper or work with your breath to calm your nervous system. Do you oh, feel like I think that's totally doable. That's a great idea, actually. <laughs> right. I mean, what a great way to uh, link into your autonomic nervous system than through modulating your breath. I mean, if I'm teaching anything on this tour, it's that we can enter into relationship with our nervous system in a way that 
facilitates our self-regulation because at the moment we're suffering from massive whole society level limbic hijack uh right we're suffering yeah. from um uh, yes. a takeover of our nervous system by mm. energies that are very um over in their um fear mongering yes. etc Yes. There's a lot of stress in the air. We have a whole generation of kids who are who are like um stressed to degrees that are beyond anything anyone has ever experienced. I have great empathy for them because they're being asked to endure a kind of stress level that that keeps them at a peak of anxiety. And I'm trying to step in with this tour and say, okay, so great, that's going on. And also, here's these little things you can do for yourself uh, to self-regulate mm. and take back. I don't want to say, I guess I'll say control because I'm not, I'm not, it's not so much about controlling yourself in the, in a negative sense, but stepping into the role of of um leader for yourself rather than allowing yourself to be led like by the bull ring uh down a path of fear and anxiety that's being served up by the shovel full all day long because it keeps our attention so you know our attention is a commodity right now to a degree never surpassed our attention is we are the product that's being sold our attention and anyone who can grasp that attention and 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 sell it is going to make money. So the question is, how do we pay attention to ourselves? How do we give ourselves? I don't. And you know, say, oh, we're, we're the most narcissistic people that's ever roamed the planet. Yes and no. <laughs> you know, mm. because actually. Are we really paying attention to ourselves or are we paying attention to what we're told matters about ourselves by certain strategists who would sell our attention? So if we if we turn the table a little bit and and step in and say, oh, I can actually feel into myself. How do I feel? Well, it's a little ratty in here, a little wired, <laughs> a little crazy. Okay, so what can we do about that? Is there yes. anything that we could do to shift that? I mean, just literally going and just when you're in that state, literally just blowing some wind across your lip membranes here, right? Just making breath go over epithelium and mm -hmm. just pay attention to how that feels. And if and do it, just do it a few times. And it's like, oh. Okay, all of a sudden I don't even remember the news. I, I don't you know, I'm not sure when my taxes are due at this moment. It's okay. <laughs> Great point, Kel. I can have a moment here. Or I'm in the nerve tour, I'm taking people through certain like brain interoceptive exercises where you can feel your way in there. And honestly, it feels so good. Yes. To make those connections. And then it's like, oh, even though I feel bad a lot. I can feel good on purpose mm. um, in a way that actually regulates my nervous system, in which case I become the, I have a choice with regard to how my nervous system is being led. Great point, Gil. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I'm raising two young children right now and well, teenager and 17 and 10, and I can mm. attest to 110% to what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, I feel it in my own experience, but when I was, I'm watching children, I, I definitely, mm -hmm. I like that you're bringing so much attention to the fact that how intensely hijacked <laughs> concentration, awareness, and what to focus on is right now. Yeah. It is a big deal. It's, yeah. It's a big deal. <laughs> and it's kind of like our lives depend on it. I feel like it's really uh, a big deal. Yeah, I agree with you. In other words, we're spending our lives. That's what we do here on planet Earth. So how are we spending them? 
Like where are, because this is what we're doing. We wake up in the morning and you're going to spend a day. (laughs) (laughs) How are you going to spend it? And we can spend it, you know, in a way that, you know, enhances our experience and those of the people around us. We can fritter it away. It's all right. We're allowed to fritter some of it away. That's part of the deal here too. You can fritter. You can you can waste. You can waste some of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and we're allowed, you know. But yeah. but we don't have to spend it Great for point. purposes that uh, that aren't necessarily supporting our experience. Well, good point. I like the way that you're blending your passion for anatomical study, but then bringing it into a relatable, in the moment, day to day experience. So this sounds more than just a look at these tissues, study, memorize the name, and now take a oh. test and, and and hopefully fill in the blank correctly. But bring <laughs> bring the <laughs> the actual understanding of the human body, but into into real life experience. So, and I also noticed that you have a PhD in theological studies where I'm getting this sense of your philosophical inquiry aligned with your physical, like, like actually investigating the body, the physical body that you can touch and feel, which is fascinating. Can you share? Yeah, I'm wanting to bring those worlds together a bit, yeah. or let's just say I am bringing those worlds together in myself. Well done. So just yeah. for having, yeah, you know, yeah. gotten a PhD in ethics from the University of Chicago, <laughs> uh, and then that world was constantly evaluating, studying, and pontificating, <laughs> mm. making rules or studying rules with respect to the body while having no knowledge or connection or em- of the body or sense of embodiment. So that was one side of my world. That makes sense. And I was like, okay, this is disingenuous to have so much to say about the body except to have a connection with it. Mm. And so my, my study of massage, rolfing, tai chi, getting married, having kids, raising children, uh, and doing dissection, that whole part of my life has been a quest for a deeper sense of embodiment so that when I reflect on things ethically, I'm not doing so um, from a position that's alienated from an embodied stance. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> like, what does the body have to say about this that you're giving all these orders to that I have to live with? You know, so it's very interesting to look into the human form and see, you know, ideas uh, that might influence how we live in the world. Like, in other words, this is how we live in the world. We live in the world in an embodied way. If morality is our way of being in the world and ethics is the study of ways of being in the world, uh, then then we ought to learn something about the body or from at least in my person, someone else does legal ethics. They go and get a law degree. Someone does medical ethics and they go become a doctor and an ethicist. I became an anatomist and an ethicist because I felt that, that in order to really speak to an embodied people about their way of being in the world, you ought to have a connection to the body. Mm. And, and then on, on the other side of it, as I've looked into the study of anatomy and physiology and all of these things, there's a real lack of philosophical insight with regard to what you're doing. So it's like you go into a physiology book and it says that in the first paragraph, we are using a mechanistic model, you know, or we are mechanists. They're very, they're very forward uh, in their admission of that without actually um, considering the, implications of that for the for mm. what you see in other words if that's your starting point well what will you see or what will you allow yourself to see how will you lim- how will you be limited by your assumptions and how will your assumptions you know bring you into new yes. understandings they can it can do both but you have to know you have assumptions <laughs> you know yeah you, you have to be cognizant of your assumptions to make an argument and so my ethical training helped me to you know have a have a 
knee jerk, <laughs> yes, you know, r recognition of the obviousness of assumptions that, is, uh, that are uninspected. That is so cool, Gil. You know, I when I was reading your what you wrote on your website, you wrote integral anatomy sees nature as a mirror reflecting self rather than the other and looks to develop an understanding of the whole person as well as the whole body. And I feel like what you were just saying, when I read that, when I first read that, I went, Ooh, let me think about that for a moment. That's good. Mm. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> yeah. But well, I, see, I see what you're thing. getting at. I, I, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. You know, like, I get it. Let's, let's claim, if we're going to claim a starting point, you know, if you're going to use machines as your mirror, that's a very left brainy way of going about things. You know, you're going to, you're going to see things as separate parts, perhaps working together, um, replaceable probably, and, and without ever getting to a sense of the whole or even connecting with life. Integral anatomy starts with an individual, which is a form of nature. And I do look to nature as my mirror because it feels good. You know, if you're sitting in a box room, you're sitting in a box room right now, I'm sitting in a box room right now, <laughs> right? The, the yes. forms around us are Euclidean geometric projections of the mind. You're literally in a rectangle, yes. 3D rectangle <laughs> thing. Well, how does that feel when you are a form of nature? You are trees. You're a friggin' plant in that room. And you, when your energy reaches out and touches the walls, it doesn't feel uh, its likeness, mm. Ooh, right? And point. so we get weird and tired when we're inside of these boxes. And But when we go out in nature, it's like you, you suddenly breathe. You're like, why can't I breathe now? It's because when your heart reaches into the space around you with its electromagnetic waves and they go quite a distance, it palpates a tree. It palpates grass, a bush, fractal forms. It sees them in a distance. You you see that and you literally see yourself in the mirror. I mean, when I see a tree, I see my lungs. I see I see my relationship to the earth breathing. Yes, um, I've yes. I've dissected the lungs many, many, many times and and enjoyed, always enjoy the ever the ever expanding branchings. Uh, you know, of the tissues in, in their interwoven fractal forms. And then you see that outside. I'm looking out the window right now. I can't help it because I'm like, I'm, I'm thirsty now. I'm talking about it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, like eat, get me out of this box. I'm like, I got to get out of some tree. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I intentionally say things like the nerve tree. You know, mm. to bring that into people's consciousness rather than I don't talk about the nervous system so much. You know, I say it because it gets me into a conversation with somebody because mm. they won't know what I'm talking about if I just mm. say the nerve tree over and over again. So I'll say the nervous system as a way to get you into a conversation so we can actually talk about the nerve tree, which is a living fractal form uh, communicative uh, organ that is uh, like this pulsing jellyfish in, in interwoven with every other tissue of the body. Its arms and tendrils are wrapped together with those other arms and tendrils of other differentiated structures like the heart, which is also a branching fractal form. And then they're so interwoven that they mutually interpenetrate each other, you know, such that the, you know, the, the, arterial tree is wrapped in nerves and the nerve tree is penetrated by capillary system networks and they're not they're not separable except as mental constructs and and to experience that you know in the body or to witness it at some level or at least to be told to think about it you know brings you a little closer uh to it i think and allows you to have a different experience than if you think you know, my nervous system is some kind of schematic in a book with lines at right angles branching in and plugging in like a friggin', you know, electrical panel in your house or something. Oh my gosh. The picture you have on your website of you real high up in a tree. And when I saw <laughs> the nerve tour and I saw you in the tree, I thought, the nerve tree. That's so cool, yeah. man. That's a great picture. <laughs> like just visually seeing the tree, the words connected side by side. I think even that imagery was power is powerful 
It's, yeah, and I'm a, telling you, I have climbed around in it. <laughs> climbed, like, right? That's what I did. That's See, that's what the nerve project was, was me mm. climbing around in mm. that tree mm. and getting to know it so that I could get it simplified enough that I could tell stories about it and help other people enter into connection with it. Because that's very empowering, I think. You know, to if if the if, ner- if the nervous system is just this ridiculously complicated schematic in a book with a mm. bunch of taxonomies dividing it over and over again into more and more complicated sets of words, then you're alienated from it rather than enter into connection with it. But if I can show you, you know, a body that was a person's body, actually a person that I knew, all right, a friend, and 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 have you want to know him. And and then witness these nerve tissues in such a way that you have to say, that's in me too. Mm. And then you can be like, okay, I wanna I wanna enter into a personal relationship with this. Cause you know, and then once I do, then I can own it. And if I can own it, then I'll stop giving it away to the <sighs> stupid television or what have you. And don't get me wrong, I love to watch Netflix series. <laughs> you know, know we're watching you the Orville right now. Rachel, my partner, and I, we just love <laughs> Star Trek. Uh, it's great. They're always probing philosophical questions on the shows. I, I really enjoy them. Uh, but the so I'm not like a anti anything guy. I'm just saying. I like, understand. You spend your time the way you want to, the way you yeah. choose. And and if you feel hijacked, you are probably. And you need to take back the helm, you know, of your own nervous system. Oh, this is incredible. What kind of what kind of uh feedback are you receiving? Like after the presentation? Uh what tears, kind of, tears. Uh, hugs, <laughs> wow. a lot of appreciation and and uh and autonomic reset. People wow. you can literally get an autonomic reset in this talk. Uh, it's quite beautiful, actually. Uh, so folks are really, really connecting to themselves and having a lot of aha moments and uh, uh-huh. get a lot of appreciation, which is always nice. Uh, I think that it's easier to learn when you're appreciating rather than when you're antagonized or fighting. Or You, know. you can learn that way, too, but I kind of like to, to ride the appreciation train. Do you ever receive uh opposition like i heard i listened to a podcast that you're on earlier uh um today because i wanted to do my homework and and uh at the beginning of the podcast the person had said you know if you're if cadaver work and or dissection offends you then you might not want to listen which i understand that's that's true sometimes i hear people say that odd yeah. Uh, you just froze for, oh, I don't my, know, maybe 20 seconds. Oh, my apologies. Let me start that question over. Sometimes when I mention anatomy and cadaver work, people will clam up. Like they'll they'll get really squeamish about the concept. I, I'm mm-hmm. fascinated by it. So I, I don't, it's not that I don't understand it. I mean, I guess I do understand it because there's a lot of uh, culture that, you know, like, like might look at doing dissection as like, oh, you shouldn't do that or, or that's gross or, you know, that type of reaction. Now I'm guessing everybody that comes to your presentation is of our like-minded thinking and are curious and interested. Do do (laughs) ever spouses who get dragged along (laughs) and, and, uh, and partners, you know, yeah, who are like, yeah. who, who love my work and they, they're keen to share it with their partner. But the partner comes in pretty, you know, uh, skeptical or yeah. with trepidation and that same fear you described. And I, I can win them over pretty quickly because my <laughs> talks are always woven with nature pictures, family photos, you know, things that soften the blow or, 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 or rather till the soil so that the yeah. seeds that get planted can actually go, go in, get some water and sprout. Yeah. So, I mean, I had a person with zero, uh, uh, the partner of a friend and uh, the partner was an accountant with no connection to anatomy and hung in there for the whole five hours and loved it. So nice. it, it is that's cool. uh, you know, edge of the seat because it's really pretty engaging. So I, I've made this. I mean, I always be like, if my mother can't follow this, <laughs> I did it wrong. You know, she's 89. She doesn't know anatomy. And so to my mind, if it doesn't engage someone there, you know, it will engage 
anyone with any professional interest yeah. in it. Yeah. Uh, and yet I am not only wanting to engage even professionals as professionals, I want to engage professionals as human beings, you know, who aspire to, you know, learn and grow in their whole person, not just in their, you know, professional or intellectual prowess. That's so cool, Gil, because as you're saying that, I'm thinking I got to bring my kids to this. You know, mm -hmm. like I wasn't thinking that beforehand, but now that you addressed childhood challenge and then the way you're weaving it together, it's making me think I need to bring my family because 10, ten uh, might be a little young. For ten, this. OK, well, thank you for me. OK, um, I, I was a homeschool dad and I know what my kids could handle. How old was the other one? 17. 17 could definitely hang with it. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you said that. Uh, it's I appreciate at a that. level, you know, yeah. there's a ridiculous yeah. amount of yeah. vocabulary verbiage that pours out of my head. And I tell everybody because it's just too many <laughs> words for anybody. Even the most professional person will be like, Oh my God, that's word salad to the max. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, I'm going to make a lot of words, but what's more important is that you ent enter into relationship with images and let my voice yeah. be like a sing song in the background, yeah. you know? Uh, and yeah, I'll say things that might turn you on, etc. But what it's really yeah. about, you know, is not, this massive vocabulary that accompanies. Well, uh, that's cool. I appreciate that. That makes sense. I mean, I, I teach anatomy during our teacher training program. And oftentimes I feel like if I can get 30% to actually listen and, and, you know, that's a huge accomplishment. What is your technique for when you feel like, I'm sure you've been in anatomy classes where you've maybe thought this is such a boring way to interact with this. This could be done so much differently, which I get the feeling this has been your mission to like, bring it to life and make learning anatomy fun or at least interesting and, and relatable, but it is such a heavy subject or heady subject. Can you give some insight into... Well, I'll tip my hat to, to Tom Myers and Ron Thompson. They were my first exposure to anatomy study. I was a grad student in ethics, and here I am showing up at the Rolf Institute, this uber intellectual, and my professor's at the University of Chicago, their their model for class interaction was war. You know, you you went to battle for your ideas and you crushed your enemies. That was it. <laughs> it was it was brutal. And and uh, and when I got to the Rolf Institute on Pearl Street, there three hundred one Pearl, I think it's like a marijuana dispensary now. But at the time, it was the Rolf Institute. And uh, Tom is. Tom Myers was up there in front of the classroom and he's dropping his pants and showing us his quadriceps and he's just <laughs> funny as all get out. And we, we had, so I, it was like so different than what I was used to where literally the professor is a general and, and you're literally like troops marching across the battlefield to <laughs> slaughter your enemies on the other side of the seminar table. And here we were just playing yeah. and I was like, Oh my gosh, I could be a teacher. Uh, you know, it, yeah. I was like, I could, I could, I, that I can relate to. I don't want to do what my teachers are doing in grad school. I don't want to have anything to do with that. It's, it's like whack, intellectual whack-a-mole. Like your professor's up there in a suit at a podium and they say something and someone re reaches up and tries to argue with it and they go, plonk, and, <laughs> and, someone goes, plonk, and they just beat you down. And I was like, okay, that's uh, interesting. Um, I respect these people. They're really smart. And I don't ever want to uh, yeah. do this dynamic, yeah. you know, but when I yeah. saw, saw the way Tom taught and Ron was also hysterical and engaging. And I was like, no, I could, I could, uh, I could do this. And then another, a rolfer also has a huge influence on me, uh, Don Van Vliet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you ever heard of Don Van Vliet, but I... he taught with Emily Conrad. Uh, he was Barbara Brennan's rolfer. Uh, you know, he was he was a, a rolfer in New York City, and he he was an energy healer as well. He was clairvoyant, and he could he was also a ballet dancer. He had all kinds of talents. Uh, but he was a real summonot, a real body explorer. He would spend hours a day on his jungle gym, winding around, talking to his bacteria. He was a very funny guy. <laughs> yeah. And he was so excited. He was so jacked up about, about what he was into. Huh. And I remember I did a, I was going to do an interview with, with, uh, with Don, rest in peace. He died a few years back uh, with Don for the Rolf lines. And I, I went and I asked him one question. And he literally just just gave a like an hour and a half long 
<laughs> answer to it. And I recorded it. This time I pressed record. <laughs> and when I went home and tried to transcribe it, I was like, there's literally no period. I can't, I can't punctuate this thing. <laughs> it's just not but the, the thing was that he conveyed was his just deep enthusiasm and uh, excitement. And it was absolutely contagious. Yeah. And I might not have understood a word he said, but I left exhilarated from my time with him and wanting to be excited about what I was excited about. Yeah. And and so he led with it. excitement. And <laughs> that's what I try and do. I, I try and lead with excitement. I have found that it's people don't want to know what you know and say, oh, he's smart. You know, they want to be excited about what they're excited about. <laughs> so I, I got a good lesson from oh, man. from uh, from Don on that and from Tom on how to have fun and play in the classroom. And it it, it was I, I picked up on those themes and, and ran with them. I also had a wonderful professor in grad school, uh, not in grad school. I had wonderful professors in grad school, although they were generals. Uh, I My professor in college, uh, Tom McCullough, ethics professor, was kind of my mentor there. And he was all about building community in his classrooms. So he wanted that conversation to happen, but he wanted it to happen civilly with kindness and respect, appreciation, and real listening for to someone else. And I took that from him and brought that into, into my work. And uh, also, you know, I spent five years in a psychodynamic energy healing school in lower Manhattan. Wow. After my Rolfing training, I went and did that and became the anatomy teacher for that school that's really kind of got going when wow. i started doing dissection and Psy that psychodynamic seed, psychodynamic yeah. can you say psychodynamics that psychodynamics and energy healing yeah can you continue to define that for me or give me a little insight sure. into what that psychodynamics really comes from wilhelm reich ultimately he's kind of the father of psychodynamics i would say and Reich is sort of the father of body work, but coming from the from the psychologist's side of the fence, uh, Reich was in Freud's inner circle and was kicked out because he put hands on people. He's like, it's in the body. You got to touch people. You can't just have them laying there in the couch. And that was the absolute forbidden thing to do uh, for Freud. Um, so Reich mm. formed his own world and it evolved touch. And from him came people like Alexander Lowen and John Paracas with bioenergetics and core energetics. Barbara Brennan studied core energetics with John Paracas, whose wife was a channel, Ava Paracas. And so you had the pathwork lectures that were channel lectures from uh, from the guide. And so people would do this work together, pathwork and 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 uh, body work. And Barbara wow. Brennan was in that lineage. And my teacher at the healing school had been Barbara Brennan's assistant for some five years or so, and then branched off and made his own school. So I went to the school that involved kind of the lineage of Wilhelm Reich through John Paracas, Barbara Brennan, my teacher. And we would read these pathwork lectures and, and we would, you know, lay hands on each other. And so that was a foundation for kind of working with groups that I developed. And I don't work any any way near the style that my teacher worked, um, Levent Bolokbasi, but but I did realize that what's important is that people are growing as human beings here. And so I may be teaching anatomy, but w w the reason why I'm bothering is to help facilitate people's connection with their bodies so they can grow as as a person and have spiritual development, you know. So my workshops have always been transformational. Uh, that's uh, and that I think is is from my lineage of the healing healing work. Amazing. Uh, this is my healing work. It's Amazing. my personal healing work to learn, study, and teach, and it's my healing service to create opportunities where people can step into their own transformational experience through, you know, appreciating their bodies, getting connected with them. And then seeing where that might take them. Amazing, Gil. I can't wait to to hang out with you in person. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, you know, I I noticed like you're going to be here in North Palm Beach on Feb 22nd, but I also saw you're going to be in Miami on February 20th, and then yeah, in Orlando Feb 25th. So those of you listening, I know it's far and wide, but. If you're not in Florida, I know you're all over the place. Uh, your tour dates are so extensive. I mean, when I look at a rock band or a, a musician, they don't 
they're not touring even as in heavily as you are. It's pretty impressive. And I just want to thank you so much, Gil, because I, I wrote you about a year and a half ago and you were so kind to respond to me, you know, and I knew it was a, I knew it was like a, a shot in the dark because I thought, you know, Gil's got so much going on and I know we didn't know each other, have that, have a connection, you know, by, from a person and you were so kind in your response and so thoughtful and, and you said, I'm real busy right now working on what you're now presenting and, you know, contact me in the future. And I just want to thank you that for sort of generosity. I felt that from the start. And I mean, your enthusiasm is so infectious. I, I, I just, I really appreciate it. The first YouTube video I watched of you, I don't know. I have to ask you this. I swear you had somebody in the background moving the plant around. I think it was, <laughs> I think you were doing like a, something about the IT band, something about how massage therapists say you got to stretch the IT band. And you were saying, look, let me show you what the IT band looks like, which for me was so amazing because I didn't even realize how flat and wide it was like that. Mm. That was cool. I always had like my, my textbook vision of the IT the band, this, little, this little thin little wire going down the side of the leg. So when you showed on the cadaver, what it looked like, but but on top of it, the plant's moving in the background. You're doing some funky head movements. And I was like, what is going on right now? And I was just so intrigued. It just like caught my attention. I was like, this guy is cool. This guy well, is doing something so you, unique. The thing is, I move so much. I'm literally like, I'm just like, uh, I'm a mover. I, I, you've looked at like little videos of me when I was a boy out on the baseball field and I'm like moving around. I couldn't stand still. I was one of those kids and, and it hasn't changed. It's gotten worse actually. Gone. And so we filmed that. And at the time we'd film it little clips and maybe Rachel would edit it. And I edit everything now. Uh, but those that we were trying to like, just throw something up on YouTube. So she grabbed a clip and edited it and she, she was like, oh, my gosh, Gil is just like a Mexican jumping bean here. He's <laughs> rolling all over the floor. What can we do? And she had some filter selection. And it was like a stabilizer filter. So she's like, let's stabilize him a little bit. So when she clicked the stabilizer filter, she didn't really look at what happened. And then we, I put it up on YouTube <laughs> and I saw the plant dancing around the background because basically – they stabilize me. And so the plant was rocking. Oh my gosh, man. I instead had to the ask other that. way around. Instead, if you left it, the plant would have been still and I would have been all over the place, but instead they kind of made, made everything move around me. And it just is nauseating. I have so many people uh, writing in underneath. They're like, what's with the plant? <laughs> no. It's brilliant though. I think it worked in your favor because <laughs> I don't know, a little stuff like that. Like, like when you mentioned your anatomy teacher saying, here, let me pull down my pants and show you my quad. Like, and you're like, what the heck's going on? It's something about that. Just, it just made me <laughs> it like it even you. more. It worked for oh, that's great. I needed I'm glad that. To hear it. I needed it. Well, <laughs> well, Gil, man, this has been such a pleasure. I can't thank you enough. I mean, uh, I, I. Pleasure is mutual, Todd. I'm appreciating your invitation here and a chance to chat with you. And I very much look forward to meeting you in person before uh -huh. long after I get through uh, the uh, New Orleans, Texas, and then the Florida Panhandle, <laughs> Pensacola, Tallahassee, Gainesville, Tampa, Fort Myers, and then we'll come over to Miami and uh, and and uh, Jupiter and Orlando and Jacksonville. Amazing! I know. I, I I think that the cross section of America that you're being able to witness by touring around the country that would be that would be my question. Maybe at the end of your tour, like, what is your synopsis of America from the ground? Mm -hmm. From, I'll from, tell you, I love it because I went around in 2017 to 46 cities. So it was this it was this tour uh, warming up. Mm. And so I did go to almost all the states. And instead of going to four cities in every state, I went to two. And um, I'll tell you, you know, once you once you get out of range of a city, maybe five or 10 miles and you know, the radio starts to go fizz, 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 mm. and you can't get those city channels anymore. Yeah. You realize that most of the country is empty, number one. Like this is one vast, beautiful, empty land. And you go paranoid about uh, overpopulation when you're in the cities and understandably because they're so crowded. But we have a just such a beautiful, vast, rich, gorgeous country. And 
people think in different ways in a country than they do in a city. And they deserve just as much respect. <laughs> so, so that was one of my takeaways. Good point. You know, Good point. I really loved um, that there's that the different environments cultivate different ways of seeing and being in the world that are all uh, all needed to make yeah. the whole thing work. Yeah, um, cities have to eat, and uh, and my respect and appreciation for the for the folks outside of the cities grew immensely on my last tour. And uh, I think I'm doing the same now. It's just growing some more. That's so cool, man. Ah, oh, thank you, Gil. <laughs> this is like, what a treat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to share this. I, um, I hope to have the opportunity to interview Rachel. I, she, she looks amazing as well. Rachel Scott. Oh, I'll, Rachel I'll... is amazing. She's got her whole world. Rachel Scott, uh, yoga. She's Rachel yoga.com. She's a very, um, she's an amazing teacher. That was one of the things that attracted me to her. I was like, man, this lady, she is smart and on it. And I listened to her working with people because we live together and it's in the background. And I'm like, damn, she, she can, she's so good at helping people cultivate their talent, you know? I mean, the two of you together, this is like a powerhouse of education delivery. Do you guys have, I mean, you are living your future. I mean, not to say like, what's your future plan? Because I, mean, I feel like you're doing it now. It doesn't need to be any different or better or change or whatever you're doing it. But when I see what she's doing with helping yoga teachers create yoga teacher curriculum, creating templates mm -hmm. with her background as like a writer, and then, yeah. and then cultivating uh, plans that work with Yoga Alliance and these other organizations, mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, like, that's amazing. I don't see anybody else doing that. So between your work uh, with the she, body yeah, and she's what she's doing, mm. I mean, yeah. what, what, you guys are, you guys are going to take over the world or something <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. You know, like, I like what you guys are doing. I have big Thank respect you. for it. I think if you ever get tired or wonder, you're fixing a flat somewhere in Texas going, what are we doing? I just want to let We're you know. We're always tired <laughs> I'm fixing a flat somewhere in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's what, you know, uh, uh, ch uh, chop wood, carry water, right? That's, we do a lot of wood chopping and water carrying. Like you said, um, the admin, you said the admin, or like, it's like mountains of admin. Like if you knew how much tsunami. work behind the scene we had to do, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it because we see the glory like the five hours on stage and we think wow how cool but you're like yeah. Dude, there's a lot of work that goes behind all this so and we're we're our own roadies too so we're like grunt physical work before and after each event like i drove down to, uh, this morning to san antonio to scout out the parking lot see if my camper would fit where am i gonna load in load out and how which screen can i bring in how high is the ceiling do i gotta mm -hmm. move the chairs where's the mm -hmm. potty mm -hmm. so we can tell everybody that mm -hmm. then i come home and you know yeah, i believe uh, it figure you, it out you so. got you got to get a plant on a little shaker like you got to get like some little thing that you can mount a plant on <laughs> So when we left, the day we left for the tour, my my son and his girlfriend presented us with the nerve plant. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it. It's got this beautiful, oh, this yeah. beautiful um, yes. line. So there Dude. it is. There, All right. Here you go. Thank you, man. I needed that. I needed that. That that rounded it out right there. And, and then I have one last question for you. If we yeah. could, you guys are on the road. If we could, I know you can get anything you want on the road. If we could bring you something, what's like something that you absolutely love, like a coconut water or a, 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 a like, you know, what do you, what would you like? A, a power bar? A, um, you know, something I do enjoy those Coco Vitas. Coco Vitas. All right. <laughs> I cool, never man. buy them. All right. Because I don't know. I don't think of it. Those things are yummy. I know what you're talking about. All right. That's cool, Gail. What about sweet. Rachel? Could, what about Rachel? There's got to be something that. Rachel is a is a caffeinated coffee machine. All right. <laughs> easy. You're making it easy for me, Gail. All is, right. Her family, <laughs> her grandma passed away about a year ago. No, two years ago. Oh, my gosh. Time flies. At 102. Wow. And this lady was pounding down the caffeinated coffee at midnight. <laughs> and just fall right asleep. Grandma, it... <laughs> like, Grandma, can I get you a water? She's like, oh, so I've already gotten her four coffees. She's like, well, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. And you, she would reluctantly <laughs> accept the offer of the water, but not drink it because uh. she was pure caffeine. And uh, her dad is just the same. And so is she. Awesome. It's intergenerational caffeination maximum. Yeah. Perfect, Gil. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I appreciate the insight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. You know it, man. You know it. Well, I can't wait. Thank you for your time. And I will see you soon. Awesome. Thank you too, buddy. Thanks, Gil. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time.